really great, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, so now I will introduce everybody. But what you see with what we just did it, is a few things, right? It got us all talking to each other, get us to know, get us, help us get to know each other a little bit. It was modeling what goes on in some of our classrooms, so you get an, an idea of some of the activities that go on in a world language classroom and perhaps other classrooms. Um, and so it kind of gets us into the idea of the night, which is talking about learning, learning strategies, um, and what can we do from our perspective or from your perspective to help students where they need it. So um, I want to start with introductions. You met Kathy, Kathy Seller. I'm Kristen Fox, the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction. And I'm going to go down the table. Ask you pal, to introduce yourself. Hi, I, I'm Teresi. Um, kind of, uh, in a principal. I'm in a vortex of uncertainty right now. <laughs> I'm the eighth grade assistant principal of all, but I'm also the acting principal at Wayne, so thanks for having me here. Uh, Greg Homer, K 12 Method Supervisor. Thomas Yap, District Science and Technology Supervisor. David Unsher, English Language Arts Supervisor. Stephanie Sarafin, Spanish teacher at Ridge High School. I'm Jen Ray Fields, I'm the Social Studies Supervisor. Stephanie Orr, I'm the Special Education Supervisor. Chrissy Euler, I'm the Assistant Principal at Cedar Hill. Amanda Hughes, Grade 5 Classroom Teacher here at Mount Prospect. Jennifer Perdick, also a 5th grade teacher at Cedar Hill School. And I'm Melanie Dupuy, I teach 6th grade Social Studies at William Madden, and I'm also a team leader at William Madden. So you see we have a mixture of teachers from across the district as well as a lot of our administrators who are here because we all have the same thing in mind as you do, which is helping our students in any way that they may need it. So before I go over the notes for the evening, I have a little video to show you to get, uh, to give you some, to share with you what I think would explain where we're coming from. Have you ever noticed how some people Subject matters to you. 
what's something you learned today? But I share something that, that I learned. My wife shares something that she learned so that even as adults, they understand that you're continuing to learn every day. And, and we make it fun and we celebrate it. And that, that way, you know, our, our children are kind of excited to tell us. I mean, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, sometimes it's something from art. Sometimes it's something from math. Sometimes it's something from, from you know, an academic thing. And sometimes it's, oh, we saw this on the bus today. Like, okay. But it's still that conversation that this value in learning is taking place. And I think that's a good starting point. Talk to me in another 10 years and, you know, we can debrief <laughs> it how effective it was. But, um, you know, I, I think that's really just saying, you know, how do you value learning? You start by just ma making it a basic conversation at home and, and making it something they're aware that you're doing as well as an adult to this day and that you enjoy doing it. I, too, have three children about the same age. Uh, and so I want to point out what Tom uh, was saying. So he's saying he's modeling. Uh, he's also talking about routines at home. So uh, having dinner together, I think, you know, that shared experience is a part of that routine and then that as a site to uh, share the stories. Um, and I think I, I want to hone in on stories uh, specifically. And another thing the language arts supervisor. <laughs> yeah. And especially at a young age, uh, I think it's important to tell stories about your family, tell stories about you when you were young, and uh, about uh, you as a learner when you were young, uh, or even tell famed stories of, well, did you know that your grandfather invented sliced bread? You know, and, and, and tell those kinds of stories where, and how did he get to do that? Because he read books, you know? And, uh, so it, it is really important to tell family stories, and those family stories that highlight uh, the importance of learning, uh, I think, is really important. Um, and they should know that anyway. They should be proud of where they kind of came from and who their family are, and even if it's a distant cousin. So I'm going to start talking now. That was great. So I'm uh, at the other end of the spectrum. I have two children who are in college. Um, they went here to Mount Prospect, and then they went on to Lens and to Ridge. Um, and I will certainly echo what my colleagues have said about talking about learning for learning's sake at home and thinking not just about the conversations you're having with them, but also the conversations they hear you having with other adults, right? And when parents are, it's very hard, I remember standing outside waiting for my daughter to come out from kindergarten and hearing the parents talk about which actual activities their children were involved with and what achievement um, they had just accomplished and feeling very much this compulsion to one say, my kid is every bit as good as your kid, and here's all the things that my kid is doing too. <laughs> right, and so they hear you on the phone, they hear you when you take them for play dates and you're talking with the parents of the other children, and what are they hearing you talk about? Are they hearing you talk about achievement? Are they hearing you talk about development and growth? So it's not just the conversations you're having with them, it's the conversations they're overhearing as well. And I'm in the middle. I have a sixth grader and a third grader. Um, but also I was an elementary school teacher as well. And I think what was really important was catching their interest and linking their interest to what we're teaching. So whether it was listening to books on CD in the car with my kids, mainly to make them stop arguing, um, but also because it gave us something to talk about. And I would say, oh, you know what that reminds me of? It reminds me of what you did with your friends or something that interested them, something that we did on vacation together. It's really important as educators for us too, when we teach something, we're really trying to link that interest and make it based on high interest to get their kids to um, remember it and make meaningful connections to it. So that's our part, but also as parents to help you make those meaningful connections is so important. Yeah, and I think one of the ways that you build interest is if you show the meaning behind it. I know you had referenced um, a previous lesson on fractions and how can I convince them that this lesson is still pertinent three months later. Uh, bring out a recipe book, show them, you know, this knowledge of fractions is going to help you determine how much you need in this recipe. You know, I had that conversation with my fifth grader because she was very frustrated with the math lesson. And I said, if you do this and you learn how to do this properly, you can help mommy cook at night. And then I could see it click that this was something useful, this was something that she could need in the future. So anytime you can help them find the meaning and the worth of that lesson too, I think it's helpful. I think the other important thing to remember is that you could do it all perfectly, and no matter what you do, some of it really comes down to maturity, right? And that no matter what, playing outside is way more fun than fractions. And sometimes we have to remember that, right? That it's sometimes we are going to model for a really long time 
But just be patient, and someday it will click, and someday they will realize, oh, I do have to practice my fractions again. So. I'm, I'm on the other end. I have a 21 year old and a 23 year old. Um, but I started when they were little. Every night I sit down and read. I take my book out and just kind of wait to see what they would do. And next thing you know, after a week or two, they would just come and sit with me with their book. So, just as you said, modeling good learning habits and styles and a passion for learning. That even though we're old, you know, in their book, that you still have a passion. You know, take a class. Do an online study, share what you've learned with them to kind of keep that spark going to see that it doesn't just go from 8.30 in the morning to 3.30. And then, you know, at 3.30 on Friday, I'm free until Sunday night. Um, they need to see that that passion goes on, you know, long into adulthood. Thanks. The only thing I'll add is, you know, all this shared dinner, shared experiences. My kids are sitting in the back right there. <laughs> 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 I guess I'm showing them I continue to you know, work hard and all that, but you know, life is busy. I try not to put too much pressure on myself. I can't do all of the things all the time, and it's fine. Um, and I try, they will be fine. And they go to school for eight hours a day, and they will be fine. And I don't need to put all that pressure on at home. Um, I try to model what I can. I tell the kids I teach middle school, um, and they're not going to like everything they're doing. And we as teachers try to frame lessons in ways that they will connect to the material. But at the end of the day, I try to say that just because you may not be interested in it, it shows grit, it shows determination, it shows character to continue to work hard, and it shows that grit, especially when it's something that you may not be interested in, because that shows that you're dedicated to bettering yourself, even when it's something you're not passionate about. So make your parents proud, make yourself proud by showing that grit and determination, even when it's not something you're particularly passionate about. What great responses. <laughs> we can make it, anyone. I just wanted to add something. Yeah, we missed. Yeah, so I'm going to stand up because it's really uncomfortable right here. Um, no, it's okay. I don't, I don't need the mic, right? I think it's also important that you recognize, like, just as much as it is important to say, like, you know, what you're learning in school is really, really important and to foster everything that everybody set up here. It's also important to have those moments where a kid comes home and goes, I have no idea what we learned today. I think we talked about it three months ago and it's ridiculous. And you can laugh about it and be able to ask them then instead what they did in art class or at recess or during lunch if they had any interesting conversations and so that they know that maybe it's okay to have an off day so like so that they understand through that conversation that like not every single thing in their life is high stakes and even the things that are high stakes have their moments where you can take a deep breath and kind of have like a breather and it's okay if, if you have a day where you're not really clicking and you're not really sure I think that's just as important as embracing learning, you know, 80, 90% of the time. That, that other 10% where you can kind of have a release valve is also vitally, vitally important for them. I have a uh, question for what she was asking she, like, and what we all are discussing right now, that our kids have a tendency to say that they learn something in September and October and now I don't remember, I don't want to like work on it because I have something right now that I'm learning that I want to work on. They are serious when they say that I want, I have something right now that I want to learn and work on, but I don't want to build any connection from what I, or I don't remember what I learned in September kind of a thing. If I look at my schooling and my learning habit, I'm not just comparing the apples to oranges, but I'm trying to understand what was effective for me personally. What helped me for this kind of a situation in my growing up days was the cumulative study that was assigned at the end of every semester, or not just at the end of unit. This is what I uh, have struggled with my kids here, and that's what we do something back at home. But it's not easy, because kids don't want to. When it comes from school, it's, they like to do, uh, they do it. But when we do it as a parents, they feel that they, we have teachers. We have parents. <laughs> yeah. We have a teacher. So we have that struggle that we have to deal with. So this is some kind of a suggestion, if school can give us any suggestion of this kind, where you can assign some kind of a cumulative testing system for them, uh, not just after every unit, but after <coughs> every marking period, a cumulative testing, uh, where they can feel and know the connection of whatever they are learning. So are you asking like for assessments? Assessments over, on, over in, in the class. In the class no, I mean, so we certainly have assessments across all of these subjects in different areas. <coughs> so are you talking about? Uh, right now, I'm with the elementary kids. In right? elementary. I'm, yeah. So in elementary, I just see there's an assessment only after a unit. Right. Uh, there is no like, 
how she mentioned, like, you know, if he has learned fraction, he's learning fraction. Just like, the months later for something they learned. Yeah. Cumulative. Cumulative something like mid semester kind of a testing or towards the end so of the school year, the whole testing for the grade, and make them feel the accomplishment for the year through testing. Because I'm sure they grow well throughout the end of the year. They are very confident kids. My kids, from my experience, they are extremely confident towards the end of the year with the way they have the memory of whatever they have learned through the year. But what I'm seeing, because this is the first year where I'm seeing he's getting introduced to grade system too, where he's bringing home grades and I'm seeing his response with those grades. And he feels really accomplished looking at the percentage that he gets or with the grade that he gets, though he's so young, though he's so little. So maybe other kids might be different, I don't know, but from my kid's perspective, I feel if he gets any kind of a cumulative test, he'll be feeling more confident about his grace and, and, and mm -hmm. accomplishments. And anybody want to speak to this? I don't know, it's you know, just I, my I, kid, I, but I'm just again speaking from yeah, my I, kids. I, I think an elementary yeah. teacher might be able to tell you a little bit about what the approach mm -hmm. is. So, so my first thought, just about, I teach fifth grade, and my first thought is that a lot of what I'm doing is naturally cumulative. Right, so like what I'm teaching them in September, let's use reading as an example, you know, I'm teaching them how to make a connection, make an inference, you know, make a prediction to what they're reading. Fast forward to June, I'm asking them to write an essay about an inference, a prediction, or a connection, right? So there's lots of steps in between, but they, don't, they think, oh, well, I did learn that, so I'm done with it, but I don't think they know that I'm kind of asking them to, that they have to keep doing it. And the same thing that I can say is even in math, it's almost the same kind of thing. Like we've started with you know, a higher level of multiplication and then we're using that same multiplication strategy with fractions. Then we're using that same multiplication strategy with mixed fractions. Now we're gonna use that same strategy with mixed fractions and division. So I think our program is kind of naturally cumulative as we go, but I'm not sure that they are in a spot where they see that. Yes, if that makes they sense. don't feel that right. they are doing something that they learned in September, October. They definitely are still doing things still that they learned in September yeah. and October. <laughs> yes, I don't know that they would identify it that way, yeah. but if you look at our curriculum and look at our program, just today I retaught something that I taught in September, because I was going, come on guys, you should know this, let's go, and then I, like, it all clicked, I'm like, oh yeah, 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 we got this. So I think they don't see it, but it's happening. Because so. they do forget. Oh, and read this <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> they open the concept and they forget about it, and then they suddenly, if you ask them to use those concepts that he learned two months ago, he's totally lost. So we have to read you with him. But I think when you when you say it in isolation and you think about the skill just in isolation, they don't, you know, as Ben said, they don't see it as. You know, okay, I've learned it and now I'm going to move on. They don't see that we're kind of, it's all, you know, in life, it's all building on things. But I think the idea of doing, especially at the elementary level, a huge cumulative end of, you know, marking period test, the anxiety that that would raise in a 10 year old, I mean, I see what happens. I've got a spelling test tomorrow. The anxiety already, I feel like we already are, you know, front loading so much of that. Not I can feel right. the. You know, I, I don't necessarily, uh, you know, as a 31-year teacher or veteran, I would say that for an elementary level, cumulative assessments to that degree would add so much more stress than what we'd be getting out of it. Um, and I think we're losing so much of the love of learning because we're, you know, for that reason. So I think that the test, you know, end of test or end of chapter tests are great because it's, you know, it's a snapshot of what we've done. And then you can see if the child's missing an area that you didn't get, you can isolate that particular area and work on that before you move on to the next How about we do Doing the cumulative testing in middle school. So we know, I don't want to even speak for Ridge, but we no longer have major cumulative ass uh, assessments at Ridge either. When I grew up, I went to Bridgewater High School and they still have it midterms, finals, half days for that, you know, two hour tests. And I grew up with that, and that's what we had in college. I had no problem with it, but I recognize that the direction um, of student learning is probably not a direction we want to go in. And I'm particularly happy that the high school no longer does that. I see, I teach sixth grade, so it's right at the beginning, but the anxiety spikes immediately. It's a huge transition. They go from one teacher, you know, one main teacher in fifth grade to multiple teachers, multiple assessments in sixth grade. If I were to add on top of that, that you now need to study three months worth of information, even though I'm layering that knowledge throughout the year, would be overwhelming, counterproductive, 
again, sort of the district goals and initiatives that we've been working towards for the last 10 years, but particularly by the last four or five, um, and I would not recommend moving in that direction um, at all. Um, and, I, and I don't think, just from in my experience working with parents, that that would be the direction that folks would want to go in either. And I just cannot recommend it from a content perspective, a teacher perspective, a parent perspective. I will speak mostly to the middle school, but it is not anything that I would recommend. And I've been teaching here for 14 years. I see the spike in anxiety, even as we reduce homework and assessments. And so we still need to do more. So adding layers of assessments would not be the answer. I think it's more about recognizing, and we could probably do a better job of being more explicit about the skills that they are learning, are building as we go from unit to unit. So yes, I may have asked you to clean out your binder. That does not mean you clean out your brain from the last three months of the work that we've been doing, right? I'm just asking you to not have a giant binder with you in school. But please know that yes, we need to maintain this information. I can do a better job of spiraling back in, explicitly making sure they know that yes, we are repeating and cycling back these basic skills. And high school? I don't want to speak to that. I don't want to speak to that. I don't want to speak to that. Sure. Um, it, it sounds so trivial, but having an organized binder, and even as an adult, like to have an organized bag that I bring home at night is super essential that you know how to get work done. Um, we have certain binder systems that we recommend. Now, typically, what we recommend in sixth grade looks very different from what an eighth grade student will end up with at the end of the year because they have identified systems that work for them. Um, typically, um, I'm not, I can't speak to what, you know, the binders they carry in fifth grade, but we often recommend they carry an AM binder, and a PM binder, and an organizational binder. Typically, after the end of each unit, um, teachers will direct students for how they want their binders to be cleaned out and organized and what it should look like. For myself, for example, socialize, I number every single handout so that it has to stay, you know, in this order so that you know exactly if you're missing something, if you need to find something, and then we clean it out every unit. I recommend that they keep it at home so it's not just thrown out, but I, I don't follow up. I'm not sure what they do with it uh, when they bring it home. Um, but at the end of the day, if we as teachers, we have team meetings where we meet every day to discuss students. And if we see a student who we call them exploding binders, we call them in for binder boot camp, we see them during lunch, and we sit down with them and say, explain to me your binder system so I can help you figure this out a little bit better. Um, and we'll reorganize it with them. And sometimes it's cleaning out. They didn't maybe follow a direction to remove some papers from your binder. Sometimes they're rushing at the end of class, and we maybe have a look at their schedule, that they're worried about being late, and they're throwing things in their backpack at the end of the day. Sometimes it's, it's something as simple as changing the color of the binders. I always recommend that the AM binder should be one color, PM binder should be another. So when they're quickly rushed at their locker, they can quickly grab what they need and not you know, have to guess. So there are little tips and tricks that we kind of recommend. Um, another thing for organization that I typically recommend, the sixth grade is such a difficult transition from you know the multiple teachers, your own locker, all the classes, is parents, I, I cannot recommend strongly enough, a large desk calendar for each child that you have. It gets taped to the kitchen wall. Here are your tests. Here are your projects. Here's when you have soccer practice that they can start sort of mapping out. Well, if I have a test coming up in two weeks and I have a big soccer game the night before, you're not going to have time to study the night before. So you need to know exactly you know, what you're doing. I, I do not maintain an online calendar still. I still have a hard copy desk calendar that I tape up. I have one for my daughter and one for my son. And they're young and they still have to see exactly what they have and when they have it. So I always say they need to start mapping out. Us as teachers, we um, team teachers at Lloyd Manor, we share calendars. We're not assigning multiple tests on the same day. We literally write it out. So I cannot assign a test if the teacher does. So I tell the kids, do the same thing. You need to map out your own personal life. I know how overwhelming it is to have all your different events and activities and you have to balance it for the first time. You're not going to get it right the first time. You're going to fail. You're going to forget to study one night and you have a soccer game. Your mom's taking you to practice to go with your little brother. It's going to happen. So learn from it. 
sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, it's a great opportunity to learn how to organize yourself, what system works, what doesn't, how to get from one class to another on time, how to manage my time, am I doing too many activities? Grades are irrelevant, they're just an indicator for what you need to work on, that's it, and that's the message we stress in middle school. So I would say different colors for AMP and binders. If the AMP and binder system's not working, go to individual binders for each subject, and just remind them to clean it out when their teachers ask them to, and if their teachers don't number their handouts for them, that's a good strategy to do to number and date it, so it just keeps it in order so they know what's older and what's newer. Um, we, we started with our fifth graders. We, we pretty much just what you said. We have them, we found the assignment pads. I don't know about any of your kids. There'll be two weeks where there's nothing written down. They, I, I know what I have to perform, I know what I have to do. But what they forget is that their brother has soccer, and you know they have tennis lessons, and all this, and all of a sudden they have a project due tomorrow. So we have them in the front of their binder when they open it up. They have a calendar, and we put, you know, important. We have the kids write in test dates, project dates. But I have a lot of kids that will also write their own personal schedule on it. So like if they know that they have science test on Monday, you know the week before they know three nights that they've got baseball practice until eight thirty. They know they have to spend time on the weekend. And it's just to kind of try, we learned with the, particularly with the fifth grade, with platooning now, you know, we're trying to help them transition a little more. We do binders too, and we do sections of binder cleanouts and all that. Um, but I think that the having a colored section and having a wall calendar, you know, where if, if you have enough space where everybody has their own calendar, great. Otherwise, one calendar and everybody gets a color. So, but they also need to see what else they have besides just the school. Because I think part of it is is juggling and learning, you know, what their own schedule is from the high school in Tennessee? Stephanie, and then Tom? Get the high school perspective. Yeah. Just going back to the learning and segregating everything that they're learning, we really do spiral everything. Things that they learn, I, from a world language perspective, everything is spiral. The thing you learn on the first day of school, you have to know in AP Spanish on your last day of school. So it's just a, really a culminating everything you just said. Keeping their interest in the topics is something that we always do. And then recycling everything, all the vocabulary, the grammar that they've learned. That happens throughout. Things they learn in math, they then transfer to what they can do in the target language in whatever subject they're taking. Think they teach me things in science that I don't know, but they can now transfer and use it in the world language. Like that, that's what I love about my subject is that they can take everything from all the subjects and put it into the target language. So I think find, for when they find places that they can use something that they've learned that's just outside of where they learned it in math class, I think that makes them feel, like you said, accomplished if they're using it appropriately and in a, in a different way. And I think that helps them maintain and retain it. Gracias, Senora. Yeah. <laughs> well, I no, I, I think as, as, as Fox earlier was saying, you know, kind of bringing the whole circle and coming back to it, I, I want to kind of really circle back to that mindset idea and that if, I think everyone up here would, would echo this, if, if you're telling a student, whether you're a parent, teacher, other, well, you need to know this because it's on the test. Every bit of research will tell you that that's the fail scenario, that there's, there's absolutely no investment, there's no rationale, and, and really it's, it's about well, why do you need to know this, how does it fit the bigger picture, and that's when you hear this idea of spiraling so much, that things will come up in these very organic ways. And, and that's something I think we, we really we struggle with to say, you know, how come we spent so much time away from this and now it's circling back? But in coming way, way back to, to where we first started with the family thing, I, I think that's where, you know, you just kind of value that learning and, and you as parents just kind of slip things in. Um, you know, playing Monopoly, there's a ton of math in that. And that, that's kind of that organic way at home you can slip a reminder about math, and if your, your child is old enough getting into fractions, you can start to, well, you know, how much, like, by how much? Did you beat it by 25%, 30%? You, you can start to slip those things in as they're age appropriate. Um, I'm blessed in that my wife is a math teacher, and that my children love math because of that, so it's an organic thing for us. Not gifted in art. Not at all. But we love when the kids come home with the projects and we still celebrate and to say like, oh, can, can daddy take that in and hang it all in his office? Like, you know, finding that way to just organically celebrate the learning and celebrate the things that they are bringing to you, I, I think is how you build that investment. So to that, uh, for the assessment board and from what you said, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of that. From, uh, from the point that you just mentioned right now about the spiral learning, 
and the assessment. But what happens in the high school is when they get go to SATs and ECTs, they get so much stressed out, and it is so enormous stress on them that they are they are really anxious about SATs and ECTs in the high school. I hope gradually it just goes away that kind of a pressure by the time our kids, elementary kids come into the high school. But how do you avoid that kind of pressures for the high schoolers where they really don't get too much anxious? Because again, if it was me coming from that schooling system where I was getting assessed um, uh, after every marking period for all three months of learning and after mid semester test and then the cumulative test at the end of the year, I said it was not difficult for a person like me because I am so used to from my elementary level school goals assistance system that ACTs and SATs were nothing for me. And frankly speaking, I had a I had a high schooler who just graduated in 2019 and is a freshman. For him, ACTs and SATs were not at all a stress compared to what I was hearing about ACTs and SAT uh, stress. So my younger one is not like my older one, so I'm going to see him struggling. <laughs> Well, you, you bring up a very important point, you know, like just the differences in children that are raised in the same environment. You, you know, you're going to different things stress out different people. If I could tell you the one way not to stress out over the SAT, I'd be a billionaire. I would write that book, patent that thing. It, it, it's so hard, but I, I think it just comes back to that that mindset and, and the acceptance of, of, you know, you, you go in and you do your best. And I, I can remember when I got my master's and going in to take the comps and sitting there, and one, of, one of my colleagues returns to me, one of my classmates, and he's like, you know, this one, you know, we, we've done this. Like, we, we've been in this program for two years, we've got this. And just, just that confidence of, you know, it's not that like, you know, you shouldn't be cramming the night before, just that, 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 that supportive, we've got this, we've been on this journey, I've seen the awesome stuff you've done. There's things we can do just to kind of reinforce because those big deadlines are coming up. It's no different, you know, I, I, I coach youth sports. And as you get the kids ready, you know, you, you tell them, guys, we, we've been doing this for forever, this is gonna be great, we're gonna have a lot of fun, we're gonna get through this together. And just again, it's really more of a mindset thing than a preparedness thing. And it, it's, you know, that, that I think is the key to de stressing in any environment, at any age, is just having that self confidence to say, I'm prepared for this, I've got this, and no matter, you know, what happens next, I'm going to be okay. And I know, Mr. Comer, you, you had the microphone, I stole it back from you. I think I'm going to say something first. So I'm going to add Mr. Comer. I had the experience of teaching. It's on. It's not on. All right. I had the experience of teaching at Ridge for 12 years before uh, becoming the social studies supervisor, and so I taught at Ridge when we had midterms and finals. Um, and I was also an AP teacher, so I was used to preparing students for a cumulative, uh, you know, for an annual uh, course of study. Uh, and I can tell you that. I think what you're speaking to, which is a really valid point, is the way students expect to be assessed influences the way they approach their learning, yeah. right? And that's a really valid point. And I think that's, and we have moved away from midterms and finals in part because of distress and anxiety, but also in part because we didn't believe, we didn't find them to be an authentic way of assessing students' progress and development towards uh, major learning objectives. So, you know, everything everybody has said so far, I think, uh, describes an approach to thinking about high stakes assessment uh, that is healthy versus an unhealthy one, right? And so we do want students to um, carry what they've learned. We don't want them to think that I only need to know this for the next test, and then once that test is over, I never have to know it again. I think we've heard some very compelling explanations that even though the kids might think that that's true, it, it in fact is not true. But it also doesn't work, right? So I, I would administer finals to students in um, world history or honors world history, really hard, comprehensive, cumulative final exams. And the next year, my colleague in European history would say to me, Jen, did you show them a map of Europe last year? <laughs> and then, and then I, he's, he's exaggerating. Of course I showed him a map of Europe. And then I had the experience of teaching seniors in a course that I had as juniors in the previous year's course with a comprehensive summative final exam. I know what they learned. I know what they had the opportunity to learn. You, you're, you, you're kidding me. <laughs> so we can give them all the tests we want, and we can try to make them hold on to it for a little bit longer, right? But, you know, the nature of the beast is that 
when it matters to them, when they start connecting what they're learning to growth and development as a human being, when they start connecting it to the things that they want to know, they'll hold on to it longer. I teach at the middle school, so it wasn't relevant really to me. I was just kind of a, a neutral observer when they mentioned that they were going to be removing the exams, midterms, and finals seven, eight years ago, whatever that was. I was pretty surprised. I was. I went to Bridgewater. We had them. I was like, well, oh, they can take them. No big deal. Isn't that what's preparing them for college? And you know, I got. I, I think that was a lot of the mindset at the time out there. I coached the swim team up at Ridge. I talked to alumni all the time who come back uh, from college. And I, you know, I asked them, you know, what was the difference in preparation? Did you feel prepared for college? Because that was kind of the argument. Well, in college, they had midterms and finals. And almost to every single alumni that comes back felt completely prepared, did not feel like they missed any preparation because we got rid of a midterm and final, felt overprepared. In fact, you know, Baskin Ridge's education is, you know, top notch. And I just, I find myself thinking that we should not be framing our education by because, well, they have to do this at work. Well, they have to do this in college. Well, they have to do this in AP. We can't work backwards that way. We just have to make them good learners at what is age appropriate. And I can't just keep my sixth grade education social. I should not be framed on the fact that in senior year of college, they have to write a thesis to graduate. I need to do what I need to do and migrate at what's appropriate. And I can't just work backwards from there. So I think it's been successful, even though we heard that argument, well, they need to do this in college. We need to teach them what's appropriate, what's effective, and what is also going to reduce their stress and anxiety. Because it's going to happen anyway. Throwing another test at them, it just adds to it without data to back up the fact that it's going to help them in college. My aim is to just uh, have them not get anxious to the end of the week. The way I see high schoolers get anxious for the time. Because that is like SOS for them to get into college admission. Because they know a particular school. I told that my daughters that that wasn't true. I told my daughter was not bothered, but he was a good student, so he could score well, but not his friends. I didn't score well, but they were really looking for good colleges. So they put a lot of struggle in their head in high school. And, 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 yeah. So I also come from a different um, education system. I've always had a lot of exams, a lot of memorize all this, spit it out, forget it the next day, and so on. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I go to the school of SATs, I was still under stress that I was of my whole, you know, um, being used to it. Because there's a lot, it means a lot. So it's not the pressure, you're not the pressure is on what that's the, like, you think it's going to have. So I don't know if it's a matter of practicing it, or just the reality of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I think there, it becomes a competition among the students. Like, how little do you have to prepare to be really, really successful? They make some some competitions among themselves. Um, they share scores with each other. They're very competitive, and they're children. And they need the adults in their life to help them put things in perspective, right? A fish never notices the sea that they swim in until somebody points it out to them. Hey, there's water here. You know. So if you tell that, if you emphasize two things: one, anxiety interferes with cognitive ability. The more brain power you're devoting to stress and worry about this activity that you're undertaking, the less brain power that's available to perform well on it. And nothing that happens to you in middle, certainly middle school, mostly in high school, is going to make or break your future. And there are amazing colleges out there for every learner. And it's our job to help them understand that there's more than 12 of them. Right? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Oh, go ahead. Hey, I also wanted to circle back to something you said earlier about the, the pride and accomplishment that your children will get when they see these cumulative exams and the grades that they were getting. Um, before my current position, I taught third grade at Cedar Hill for nine years, and one of my favorite exercises is I would take kiddos and I would show them their composition from September and then their composition in June. And the light bulb that went off in their brain when they saw all of the, the hard work that it paid off, it was amazing. So I think that there's some other ways, you know, beyond just the grade itself. You know, an exercise like that where you're showing them the progression of their work and focusing less on the number on the page, the number on the page and more the quality of the work, I think that's so much more beneficial in helping them to have that sense of accomplishment that you're reporting to. Yes. So 
I feel what are, we are trying to understand here is that the kids need to know that they are actually using their September skills in June. They are. Okay. <laughs> they, are right. they don't want to come back home and say, hey, I learned in September and I'm with it. My test is done. I don't have to think about that subject or that concept anymore. They shouldn't be coming back home with that. So uh, I'm just going to add, and you know, at the risk of making the most unpopular comment this evening, um, I, my wife is a teacher also, and, and, and we have three kids, and, and we made a conscious decision to say that, like, as we approach school, and I, I don't live in Baskin Ridge, but I do live in a district where there, you know, there, there's some high expectations, and we made a conscious decision to act in a way that our kids understand that education from the day they enter school to the day they throw that cap in the air is, is, a, is a journey and it's a process and I feel like a lot of people have lost sight of that and I've noticed it a lot in, in, in the middle school where everything becomes an event like they're, they're, the amount of events now has increased exponentially where it's like almost every homework assignment is an event did you do the math homework? It's due tomorrow. And you know, that, that becomes an event. And now they have six or seven events tonight. You know, um, you know, the Spanish project is an event. That Spanish project is due on Thursday. Oh my God. You know, it's an event. And and the SATs and the ACTs, that, that's that's a big event. And we we use the term stress a lot, and this is where the part is gonna be really unpopular. Okay. <laughs> like stress is not always a bad thing. There's such thing as good stress. And my personal philosophy is, you know, I mean, if we reach a point where the stress is out of control, yes, we need to address it and we need to address it effectively. But, you know, if you're, if you're on this journey and think of it maybe perhaps in like your own professional careers, there's some days where you're really making progress and you're doing well and you're feeling good about yourself. And then some days you hit an obstacle you know, maybe you're working two different jobs or whatever, and um, you know, you're, you're feeling like, wow, I don't think I can get this done. You learn a lot from that experience. There's a lot to take away from that, and, and it makes you a better person tomorrow. And so, yeah, I, I understand the high stakes of the SATs. I'm not gonna try to talk anybody out of that. That, that would be ridiculous. But I also do think that it, it is one of those things that occurs on the journey. It's a stop on the journey. But it doesn't have to be an event. It is, some people, some of you out there and some people here have, have remarked that, you know, that it doesn't mean you're not going to college and it doesn't mean your, your life is over. It means that, like, maybe what you had planned isn't so much in the cards anymore and you need to make a new plan. But there's so many more great things that can come from having a new plan. And I think, you know, having that more of a global perspective, like, where is all this taking us? And, you know, these little things along the way don't have to be events. It's, it's, it's not live or die, it's just some are challenging and some aren't, and, and there's a ton to learn from all of them. Can I get to your question? I have uh, two questions from my daughter, Dali. She's a uh, 11th grade. Uh, uh, first, she doesn't like to read textbook uh, <laughs> after her school, and go directly to study, uh, to homework. And, uh, then, uh, with question, she said she, she reviewed the uh, slide. But that slide is too not in detail, and uh, you, you don't have the detailed information. And the uh, second thing, she doing homework uh, with things, uh, video chat. FaceTime. FaceTime. While they're FaceTime, yeah. while they're doing that. In the homework, have 50 questions, and she FaceTime from very beginning to the end. <laughs> and uh, chatting with a uh, friend, and discuss with friends and said, this is not good habit. I think you should do it by yourself. And the first, read the textbook and uh, get the comprehensive knowledge, and then start to go home. But she ignored the uh, textbook. <laughs> and uh, secondly, she, do the, the, she said, this is efficient, this is our way, this is a new generation, this is not your So, yeah. So I, had, I told her, if you don't do the independent thinking, you, with question you don't think, but just uh, talk to each other, and even you fix this little problem, uh, you still have a lot of hope need to fix, but uh, from the homework, you, you, you don't fix them. And secondly, you don't have the independent thinking, right? You have teamwork, but you don't have uh, independent thinking. So, so yeah. 
talk about because you don't like to read textbooks. Well, I, would, I would love to do a little bit of a shameless plug. Um, hold up, I have these. Sure. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a sheet, double sided, looks like this. It was over by the uh, the front table there. Um, it, it's kind of a compilation from from my departments, um, and it, it speaks to a little bit of what you said about it, effective and ineffective. But you, you are right on in, in that human beings have changed. And, and, and I'm going to sound far older than I am, but the, the internet changed the game. And the idea that you have to read a book and remember it is lost on younger generations. Because if I don't remember it, I can now Google it on my phone and have it within 10 seconds. And so it's a different, it's a different approach. However, I think it's back to that coming again in that full circle of that value of learning and that ability to have a skill set. And you know, all the time we talk about the ways in which I, I was, you know, how did I handle things in my day? And, and you know, I didn't take a test question that matched every single challenge I saw today. But I developed skills that enabled me to get through my day. And, and I think that's that's a mindset trying to scale that down to a fourth grader and a first grader, God help me, a two year old. Um, you know, it, it's not really something. But it's just it's it's that mindset and approach to. Again, we can do this together, we can get through it together, but it is about building those habits and, and you know, at a certain point you are the parent and, you know, I don't think using FaceTime is appropriate, so I am taking your phone. Um, you know, it's not, it's not producing the results, it's producing some bad habits. When you are done, you can have it back. You know, sometimes we have to make that tough call as the parent and, we, you know, we have to, you know, fight through those tantrums and again, I'm on the low end, so my fourth grader, you know, it's different. Uh, I've been told to watch out when my daughter is a teenager that my world is going to end every single day. Um, I'll get through it, I guess. But you know, to to the point of you know, how do you do that? I, I think all of our teachers are trying to show those effective habits that work for their courses, and different things are going to work. And you can't just say this is my one skill that I'm really good at and it's going to get me through because flashcards are great for vocabulary, terrible for precalculus. Um, as, as I'm sure Mr. Comer would agree, you know, there, there's certain tactics that are better known for certain types of problems. And, and that's where my department kind of shared that, that plug I gave. And depending upon what you're trying to do, there's a good way to go about it, and there's a less effective way to go about it. And I think as you return to the idea of stress, it's not always about more time, it's about time effectively spent. And about doing the things that are more prone to success than doing more time on those unsuccessful things. And now I want to hand things over, please, to one of the, the, the teachers who lives this daily. Or, or Stephanie. <laughs> for, 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 for her fifth grade teacher. So, just, I just think this is like, we'll do another handout just so you understand. I think what you said was a really good point because it's that communication, right? Your daughter is saying, this is how I learn best. And, you know, like our way doesn't work anymore. Her way now works. So now it's a conversation, and that she's now opened the door for you to ask some questions about, okay, well, I'm telling you how I learned. I learned by reading the textbook, I learned by taking notes, I learned by doing it independently. So now we ask her the question, how do you learn and why do you think that works? Sometimes our students need to know that it's okay to have a difference as long as they have thought it through. So, you know, we talk about like where do they do where do your children do their homework, right? And so we're used to saying, well, we're going to work in a quiet environment and it's going to be well lit and it's going to be, you know, free of distraction, all these things. But there are children who learn best with music in the background. There are children who learn best, you know, like sitting on the floor instead of sitting at a chair. So it's not necessarily that um, we have to say, no, you're wrong, it's a conversation. So one of the handouts um, that we gave you tonight is some conversation starters. It's the idea that when your child opens that door, or you may have to open it for them, and say, you know, tell me what you think about this. Because it's a lot easier to have the conversation than it is to go in and just say, look, you have to do it this way because you know what's going to happen. You say black, they get white. You know, like we're just going to go back and forth and say, mom, you're wrong because your way doesn't work. I mean, that's what happens. Um, so maybe this will be a good way to have that conversation and say, well, what are you talking about over FaceTime? And how is that helping you? Because we do like when students work together, but at the same time, 
you can then ask, well, are you able to get this part of it done? And maybe come up with a compromise. Yeah, I do have a compromise. The way I said you do uh, do homework independent from beginning to end. Then at the end, you, you still have questions. Then by the time to discuss the problem, don't go from beginning to end. And uh, uh, that's a not, not good. Way. Is it working? Yeah, that's good. Yes. Uh, right now, she uh, use face time uh, yeah. less and less. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it changed. But it, 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 it's strange. Uh, I, for this uh, problem, I talked uh, with uh, her counselor, yeah. uh, with her, and the counselor agreed with her. As long as they find their best way, efficient way to study, it's, it's okay. And uh, she, because she back up her, so it's so hard for her to, to change. But it's taken a year to get less and less. I think you tapped on a, a topic that everyone in this room, no matter how old your child is, is scared to death about, and that's how the technology and the addiction. Um, I have my phone here, and I think I looked at it five times, and I didn't even open anything. I just looked at it. Like I, and I looked at it, and I'm like, what am I doing? I'm, I'm, I'm check the email now, you know? It's an addiction. <laughs> there's a lot of books on it. There's a book called Glow Kids. There's iGeneration. There's so many things that you can do now, and I think a lot of it is just us completely being aware and reminding people that you don't need to be on your phone. You don't need to check your email. You don't need to check your Instagram. We do it, it's a habit. These are formed habits that are, it takes two weeks to, well, you have to go to the gym for two weeks to really get working out. I feel like it takes five minutes to have an Instagram account to be addicted to it. So your child, my child, my child is the one who needs the music playing. And I go in there and most of the time her laptop is open and the music is playing. But there's that like, corner pop-up that just dragged her into the newest YouTube video that she has to see, and next thing she knows, she's down a rabbit hole. And we can't avoid that. The only thing we can do is continue to remind them and teach them that you have to resist, because <laughs> the temptations are not going away, right? So I think monitoring, going in your kid's room, hey, what are you doing? Oh, you're still, you're still Skyping with Jane? Cool. But, oh wait, why are the five tabs open? What's going on? Come on, shut them down. You know, not so punitive, but more showing good habits and practicing. Um, we're all guilty of it. Sitting on the couch when we should be as a family watching television, yet three of us are checking our phones. I mean, I do it. It's hard, and I have to put it down. But it's something that we're all, as a, as a community, as a, as a parenting generation, are going to have to deal with. Really just showing them, reminding them, refocusing them and helping them learn good habits so when they do go off to college, they're able to turn the app off, turn the pop-up notifications off, close their laptop. But it's something that um, is a valid point and concern that we just have to keep working at. So as to the textbook, uh, should, should I encourage, them, uh, encourage the children to read the textbook uh, before the study? So I think to Mr. Palmer's question, like, is it working for her? What's working for her is probably the beginning of the answer to that question. I do think that there's um, trends that Mr. Hunter can speak much more knowledgeably about than I can, about what's happening to students' reading comprehension, to the way students learn. Um, anything in a textbook can just as easily and more interestingly be watched in a video online, and in some cases, the demands on students' time is such that to read, so some of what they're reading, especially if it's a skill-based course, like some of the higher level math classes or, in my experience, um, economics, when students are reading a description of what's happening in an image or in a visual, they have to read the sentence, they have to stop and think about what that sentence is describing, they have to find it in the image, then they have to make that connection, then they read the next sentence. So in some cases where it's a narrative and reading it gives you a big holistic picture of it, you know, in some courses, yeah, probably to get a really comprehensive understanding if that's what's gonna be needed, but she has to make decisions, she has to do like an academic triage every night when she gets home, <laughs> right? I have X number of points on the table for tomorrow. Where am I gonna put my time and where am I gonna put my attention? And so, so sometimes some of those shortcuts will work for them depending on what's, what's called of them, what, you know, what's being asked of them. So I think the conversation is, 
where she's pleased with her performance, where she's, where she's pleased with her progress and her development, her strategies are likely working for her. And it is definitely true that if you can explain something to someone else, you've learned it, right? In a way that's much more succinct. If you can prove that you can say it and describe it to someone else, that's really good evidence that you've learned it in a way that reading it or reviewing it isn't gonna give you. So to her point, being able to explain it to her friend is really good evidence of learning. Right? But I think to, to Stephanie's point, Ms. Orr's point, having a conversation with her about where she's satisfied, where she's dissatisfied, and then start thinking about the different strategies and which, when does that strategy work for her versus when might we want to go to a different strategy. And just to follow up to, as you said, what works, sometimes when we see a good test grade, we can turn around and say, what did you do to get that? And remind them that Maybe you found a strategy that worked. And if you don't have such a good assessment grade or you're not happy with the project or you feel like you haven't learned it, well, what did you do? And maybe that didn't work. Again, it's that conversation. Well, I was talking about But I was going to say, so in fifth, we, if I could kind of bring it to elementary for half a second, we were saying today when we were discussing thinking that use elementary school as that time to figure out what works for your child. And also in that sense, we're really cautious in fifth grade about overstudy, right? We don't want them studying for two hours for a quick you know, grammar quiz, and then they think they have to study for two hours in order to get that A on that grammar quiz. So we are saying, like, kind of use elementary school to say, like, okay, let's try only studying for, like, 10 minutes for two nights and see how you do. And, Hopefully you can still do your best, and they'll, they'll still probably do just fine. But to kind of train them to see how much do I really need to put forth, what effort, where I like that term of like homework triage and figuring out what you really need to focus on. Because so often kids will get to me even in fifth grade, oh, I studied for three hours last night. And in my head, I'm like, the quiz is 10 questions long. You're okay. you're, you were fine to not even study at all. So it's kind of to find that line in elementary school when, not to say it out loud, too loud, like grades don't count much in social studies. Right now it's a beginning developing or secure. You know, like if you're going to get a developing, now's the time to do it and learn and feel it and then, you know, right, and learn from that to then be able to keep going. But when I say about that, so, you know, there's different schools, whatever goes, a lot of homework, a little homework. Right. But I think one of the concerns that I, that I have personally is the fact that elementary school is really, really like homework. But then, and so they don't develop the study habits or like, you know, this, even build the stamina to sit down for half an hour to do something, right? Then you hit middle school, and I've already seen it, I have a sixth grader, where it's not too, as bad as I expected, so it's not managing. But I, I fear that as you know, it gets a little bit more intense, he will have that, that habit in black foundation in play. That, that, that's what I see as a problem of going from no homework or one page super, super fast to a uh, lot, to having to make those trade-offs. I'm not gonna read or understand anything here because I have to fill out five questions and that word happens to be here. So I'm just grabbing this and throwing it out there. So I think, you know, I, my, my my concern is that we go from very little to potentially a lot. And I haven't seen this a lot yet, but I hear it's fine. <laughs> so you talk about how, like how, what is the skill development through middle school to high school for the kids? And like how, how do you work with them to develop that skill in terms of how do I learn how to study? So I can start with fifth grade, and I, the, my favorite term for fifth graders is micromanage. Like micro, micro, manage. And I say my fifth graders, every single one of my fifth graders' binders look exactly the same. You can open up any one of my fifth graders' binders and it's going to be their pencil case, their assignment pad, and their one folder. And if they even so dare as to try and put another <laughs> folder in there, I will be on them so fast. Because that's the organization that I am handing them, that I'm saying, I understand that when you get to Annan, you're going to have a little bit more freedom, but for right now, this is what's going to work for you in fifth grade, and we're going to hold your hand through the process. And I think that in fifth grade, it's still they need that person to model things for them. They need that hand-holding 
and they do still need that help. You know, we say to them, clean out your binder, and they're going, how do you do that? Like, well, you take the piece of paper out, and you know, like, it's, it's that simple, you know, at times, at elementary level. So I do say, fifth grade, it's micromanaged and hand-holding. So. Now, and that idea of we have to teach them to walk before they can run, yeah. you know, we need to get those foundation skills in place before we shove too much at them, when they're just developmentally not ready to do all that. Right. A lot of what we're talking about is really compounded tonight by the developmental differences among children of the same age mm -hmm. and then of the needs of different children as they age. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, watching my own children, my younger daughter had to learn how to study in elementary school because school was really hard for her. So we really kind of used their achievement and how they were feeling about their growth and development as a, as a yardstick to measure how much they needed in terms of that support and that skill development. So my older daughter did, was really, really successful without having to learn how to study um, until she got to high school. And then, you know, she she kind of figured it out. I taught um, some really super talented students who got through high school without having to learn how to study because for whatever reason, their brains were facile enough, their memories were strong enough um, that, they could they could learn by listening and a few practice problems and they and they learn that way. So I think you kind of have to work with your child and watch their progress. And like I think I don't remember who exactly said I think it was Mount as you please said, you know, the grade is only a measure of how you're doing right now. It doesn't mean anything about you as a person or uh, it does it all it says is how well are you achieving this particular goal. Right? And if you're not achieving at a level that you want to achieve at, right, then what strategies can we try? And so these handouts tonight, I hope that you've got all of them. They're very, you know, we have different handouts that accompany different disciplines, because the needs are different depending on what you're studying for. But there are so many different strategies, and it's really trial and error. And as long as they don't feel like, okay, so when my daughter brought home her first F on a test, I mean, like, literally F. Um, so we tried something different for the next test. And then we got a D. <laughs> All right, something was working, something worked. <laughs> All right, uh, that's progress. But I also, it was seventh grade science or eighth grade science. And, and so just sort of like, all we're doing is measuring what works. And we're not saying anything about you or your, as a human being. But that's our amazing thing that we've this test. And certainly none of this is going to have a lasting impact. So let's just use it as a yardstick to measure against and try to get. And if they feel like they can try and misstep and try and stumble, it makes it a lot easier for them to approach those assessments without all of that stress and anxiety. But inherently there's some there's habits that are in mind, right? So you're developing what are the skills that are in there? I have a four-year-old and a seven-month-old, and we have a bedtime routine. Right. And those are routines that we have developed with our students. Or not, not they're not just <laughs> yeah, you know, we oh, play games, oh. um, math games. <laughs> um, but is there a routine that's studying for homework? Is there just locked in the room? Do they have a FaceTime of? Is that the routine that they go through? Are we teaching them the routines and saying, are you doing a little bit of review after the end of the, after the end of your homework? That's there. Did you study what was previously done? Do you think you can explain whatever that you learned either today or yesterday or the unit? or two units ago, or three units ago. You know, that's a routine that can be built into their study habits that goes over time. And when they see success, a small incremental success, that's what's going to lead to bigger, bigger and broader successes, right? So part of that is just helping them find the right routine that works best for them, or whatever subject that they may have to either improve, or just really find a love for. And, and kind of, again, coming coming back to where we started with mindset and, and the video, and you're not defined by this grade, um, you know, I, I really appreciate that you guys are able to share that, you know, that journey of struggle. It's important to keep that mindset at home, and, and so frequently we, we have this tendency as, you know, oh, I, you know, I struggle with that too, and don't worry, I never used it when I grew up. And that sends the complete wrong message to a struggling child. That like, yeah, this is kicking your butt, and you're getting butt kicked for no reason. Like that's that's a, a horrible thing to deliver to a child. So you know, always be mindful. As, as you know, I, I forget who said earlier about that. You know, I think it was actually Ms. Rayfield who said, you know, kids hear your conversations. 
So if you're going to, you know, have a disagreement, if I, no. again, three kids, I love things that my kids' teachers have done, I have disliked some of the things that my kids' teachers have done, those aren't conversations we ever have in front of our kids, because we want to make sure that we preserve that mindset, and we want to make sure that we keep that idea of learning in that positive light, that this is a thing that we love to do. And that's, I think, one of the toughest things as, as a parent, to, to pull back on every emotion when your kid is struggling. And, and you know, it starts at, at the earliest. I mean, how many of you have been there where, you know, oh my God, you, you've learned to tie your shoes. You just get your shoes on. We have to get out the door. And, and every ounce of you is like, you've almost got it, buddy. Come on. Like, we've been there. But it's, you know, keeping it positive, we know, is, is the key to success. And, and that's where, you know, I, I really thank Ms. Rayfield for sharing that, you know, that, that journey that Mr. Teresi spoke of. Um, it's a journey. They're going to stumble along the way. The positive mindset that that longer, long term, you're going to be okay, you're going to get through it. And I started in elementary school and now I'm in middle and high school, so I've actually had this amazing opportunity to go from first grade to 12th grade and see, like, how those kids have progressed. And the one thing that really has struck me is there are ways along the way that we help those kids who are still struggling. Because developmentally, there are kids that just are not mature enough to handle it at that time. Right? There are kids who pick it up like this, not a problem, and there are going to be kids that just, that binder is going to explode <laughs> in fourth grade and fifth grade and sixth grade and seventh grade. And we're going to see the binder exploding in ninth grade. But the nice thing is that in this district, we recognize that we need to still help those kids. So there are things that are, there are programs and there are resources and there are teachers and staff who are available in elementary school, middle school, and high school to help those kids with the binder explosions. And say, it's okay, we're gonna go over it one more time and maybe the binder might not work for you, right? Like there is a time where we finally go, the binder's not your method. <laughs> we, we learn how to use folders, or we learn how to do something else. And you know, we, you know, I laugh because I'm in the high school now where they're actually allowed to have their phones, right? And we, I think about how it's, you know, in elementary school, it's write down your homework, write down your homework, write down your homework. In middle school, it's write down your homework and check the homework portal. Like, write down your homework, and then there's the homework portal. Well, in high school, it's take your phone, and take a picture of the homework on the board. Like we're at the point now where we work with the kids at their level and say, okay, you know, we're not just gonna say, the strategy I taught you in fifth grade, it didn't work in fifth grade for you. We're gonna keep teaching you the same strategy. We alter the strategy based on the kid. And for some kids that means we give them a little extra boost than everybody else. And we, like I said, we have that, those different services available for kids all the way up through high school. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. You have one question. Yeah, I have a question. I have a first grader in, in kindergarten, and it's great to hear the philosophy seems to be maybe hopefully you know everybody on the panel as well as maybe the district to teach you the um, individual or teach you the whole child, and and um, I appreciate this. But how does that actually work, especially in the early um, learning part where you have classes like 22 to one teacher, 24 to a single teacher? So that, that's something that I'm concerned as a parent when, you know, we do have a great school district, but we also have a lot of great private schools that have much teacher to student ratio. So it's great to say, yes, we teach us, you know, we believe all this, but how do we really implement it? Um, and, um, in the beginning of the year, we spend a lot of time getting to know our students and testing out what way do you learn best. You know, what are the what are the strategies? Because some kids, like my daughter, needs to have a headset on. I hear her stomping around upstairs. You know, she needs to listen to music and be moving while she's reading her textbook. Um, you know, so we try to teach the kids find out what works best for you. And then as we're going through and they're studying the test, they get to pick what we, you know, we teach them different strategies under each of those areas. And they start to just find their way themselves. And then, you know, within the class, we're working, differentiating, you know, all throughout the day. And we're working with small groups, and one group might need you to read aloud with them. One group might be able to work with a partner, and they're, you know, able to take off and, and fly on their own. 
So, you know, we make it work because that's the way the classroom is set up. So we do the and is there a way, I know my son's teacher hasn't really communicated to me as a parent to exactly identify which way he might learn where I can then, as a parent, help with those type of learning stuff. Because I'm figuring that at home, if you want to support him as being a non-teacher, non-professional, you know, being able to recognize those cues of how he learns and ways where um, I can support that structure. Is that? Yeah, so um, I was going to say, I, came, I teach fifth grade right now, but I came from teaching first and second grade, and then um, I have a kindergartner and a third grader myself. So I will say that I think still, thinking really young, K and first grade, they're still kind of evolving, okay. right? And what's working for them right now might not work six months from now and then might not work six months from then. And so I think it's really important at the younger grades to realize that those classrooms are pretty much doing it all, all day long, right? So they're gonna be spell, they're gonna be singing their spelling words, they're gonna be dancing their spelling words, they're gonna be writing their spelling words, and um, something else. They're gonna be flashcards with their spelling words because then that teacher is kind of doing a little bit of everything, you know, to kind of get all the different kind of learners. And I think it is probably within as they get a little bit older, that's when you really start to see what's working. I think also you'll see faster what doesn't work, right? So it's almost like you can even kind of start checking out those things at home right. of realizing, okay, my kid does need quiet or my kid doesn't need quiet. So I think that's also just kind of the communication between parent and teacher to be able to work really hone in on that as they get older. And a lot changes when that reading kicks in. Like there is going to be that day where, right, they're not loving reading, they're not loving reading, not loving reading, not loving doing that, but all of a sudden, literally the next day, they're going to be walking around and not be able to put down the book. And until we find that in each grade, there's like some like light bulb that goes off. When the light bulb goes off is when we start to see which strategy works. Before that, developmentally, we try and give them everything because we're not really sure. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and that is a good point, but like in, in my particular case, you know, my, you know, halfway among kindergarten, you know, at the parent-teacher conference, it was almost like your, your, your son is basically failing kindergarten because he can't read, he doesn't know his letters, but then now he's, you know, in first grade, he's still behind, so he gets all the extra help in the, in the small group. And there's like, well, he does better small group. I'm like, everybody kind of does really well in small groups. <laughs> so, so that's my concern with this class being so big when you're at the like kindergarten, first grade, where they're still developing and everybody is so different on the spectrum and developmentally. You can't put everybody on the box. So how do you teach to the whole child, an individual child, and you know, to make him still get that love of learning and not feel like he's singled out because he's not up to par with all the other kids that are reading. You know. So you know, it's tough. I, I, know, I feel like I'm talking about all the time. So, um, I, I understand your worry. I think there's two parts to this worry, right? Like, is, is, my, is my child being uh, known and loved by, by my teacher? Um, and, you know, are my, are my child's needs being met when there's a sea of, of 20 to 25 other children? Uh, I absolutely get that. And then there's two parts, too. Is, uh, one is, well, what can I do at home? And then the other part is, well, what's being done in the classroom? Because I can't walk into the classroom every day and see like I could at preschool. Um, and so let's, let's tackle uh, different parts of it. So what can you do at home, especially for your kindergartner and, and, and first grader? Um, who's still working on acquiring letters and, and, and reading. Um, the biggest, there are two things that I'll tell you specifically. They're just suggestions. I'm going to say talk. Um, so uh, make um, make whatever you're doing at school, let's say it's, it's reading a book, make that special mommy time. Um, so they're not reading a book, they get to spend time with mom. Um, and as you're reading them, like at their, so you should be reading to them. And there are studies that show that um, at Scholastic did a survey of even high schoolers, and they said overwhelmingly, I wish my parents still read to me. Um, even though people, well, you can read, you can read now, right? Okay, so go into your bed and read. Um, through, through middle school and even lower high school, they they want to hear their parents' voice reading, uh, reading to them. Uh, so 
please read to your child. Oh, um, I don't know if you know the book Olivia. Do you know the book Olivia? Okay. All right. So uh, Olivia is a picture book, and Olivia wears their parents out, or her parents out. <laughs> um, and uh, Olivia comes in at the end and says, Look, Mom, only five books tonight for you to read to me. And they have a war. Like, no, just one. Oh, come on, three. Like, okay, fine, three, just three. You know, and they had that battle. But be that parent that makes the five. Um, and, uh, and engage, and engage your, yeah. I'm the parent who negotiates. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the parent that finds short books. <laughs> That's good. Um, and, and, when you, and when you're reading to, to your child, um, and, and you should find uh, sight words, let's say, you know, the, you know, you see the on the page, and when they get it, you really have to smother your child with kisses and tickle the heck out of them. <laughs> and and so they just they associate pleasure and attention with with what they're learning, and pleasure and attention with what they're learning. Um, and that that repeated uh, practice, I think, is going to go a long way uh, for them uh, feeling confident and successful where they are. Um, I uh, personal story. I'm sorry. Uh, so I have, I have three kids. One is a uh, preschooler, and she is much more confident dro dropping off at preschool when her older siblings are with her, when her family is with her. If it's just dad, you know, dad has to stay with her a little bit. Um, but when it's, you know, brother and sister, like, oh, yeah, okay. Hey, these are my brothers. These are my sisters. I'm good. And, and uh, it's, so it's interesting the confidence level when family gets involved. That's the point. Um, and so, to the extent that you can get involved, um, and I love what Mr. Kulner said about, you know, when you're able to teach something, explain it to another person, that's when you, when you have that level of mastery. And that goes back to your question, like, you know, is, it, is having uh, a, a social uh, experience okay? I think it is, uh, especially if your daughter is able to explain it to her peer. Um, you know, because that shows that level of mastery that Mr. Comer's talking about. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, you you can't be involved in that. So, you know, even play dumb. You know, oh, I, I don't get this at all. What is this linear equation about? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, oh, man. You'd be really good playing at that. Yeah. <laughs> really good. Dad, I can't believe I'm, you know, you're, you're family member. Let me explain it to you. you know, and, and you can make a game out of it even at middle and high school and get them to explain it to you. And you're not and you're doing it A to interact with you know your daughter and to make them feel like they're superior to you, which they're gonna take care of you one day, so they need to feel superior to <laughs> and, uh, and so but it's really about getting them to that level of mastery. Even if you have to make a fool of yourself. Eh, well, great no. <laughs> <laughs> What a great story to end on. Yeah. I really appreciate that. So um, I, I really appreciate the dialogue, but I do also want to respect your time. And it is 8.35. And I just want to thank the panel. You brought so much to this discussion. You know, so I was really happy that the dialogue focused on what we can do to make everyone love learning. That was great. Um, remember that on the handouts that people provided through are some of those concrete strategies that you can maybe revisit at home. Um, and apply to specific disciplines that uh, study for a test. That's one of the handouts. So you can maybe look at those later um, with your children. That would be a great thing to talk about. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.